production and distribution of City Club Forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Payne Fund, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here, also a proud member. Leading up to the November 7th general election, we are hosting a forums on certain Ohio ballot measures, and so I'm pleased to introduce today's forum, a debate over issue two. So what is issue two? Well, when you open your ballot on election day or prior, if you're an early voter, you will see the following. Issue two, to require state agencies to not pay more for prescription drugs than the Federal Department of Veterans Affairs and require state payment of attorney's fees and expenses to specific individuals for defense of the law. That's the part that's in bold at the top. Below it, there's a little more detail, and it says this. To enact Chapter 194 of the Ohio Revised Code, which would require the state of Ohio, including its state departments, agencies, and entities, to not pay more for prescription drugs than the price paid by the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, establish that the individual petitioners responsible for proposing the law have a direct and personal stake in defending the law, require the state to pay petitioners reasonable attorney's fees and other expenses, require the petitioners to pay $10,000 to the state if the law is held by a court to be unenforceable, and limit petitioners' personal liability to that amount, and require the attorney general to defend the law if challenged in court. If you're more interested in uh, detail, further detail, I would encourage you to look up Chapter 194 of the Ohio Revised Code, available at the Secretary of State's website. Now, proponents argue that the bill would save taxpayers money. Opponents disagree, arguing that it would increase prescription drug prices for those with private insurance. And despite ample advertising from both sides, and I do mean ample, a recent independent survey showed that a majority of Ohio voters still do not understand the ballot measure. We hope that today's debate provides some clarity. Our panelists, Dale Butland, presenting the case against issue two, that's the vote no side, and former Congressman Dennis Kucinich is the spokesman for the yes on issue two campaign. Our moderator is WKYC senior health correspondent Monica Robbins. Now here's how the debate will flow. We'll start with questions from Monica. Both representatives will have 90 seconds to respond to questions directed at each of them. The other side will have 30 seconds for a rebuttal. For questions directed to both sides, each will have 90 seconds to respond. And we will work diligently to ensure equal speaking time for both representatives. We have a timing clock here to keep everybody on task. And all of you will have a chance to ask your questions in the second half of our program. One more thing before we begin. Despite the uh, use of City Club content by the Yes on Issue 2 campaign in their advertisements, I am duty-bound to tell you that neither the City Club of Cleveland nor our primary media partner, IdeaStream, endorse Issue 2. As institutions, we remain neutral on this issue and all ballot issues. Now with that, let's get started. Monica Robbins of WKYC, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, this question is for both of you. First of all, who is financially supporting your position and why? Dennis, I'll start with you since your side put the issue on the ballot. Well, I, for myself, I mean, I'm doing this as a volunteer, but the uh, AIDS Health Foundation has been supporting this, and I think that it's a continuation of the work that the AIDS Health Foundation has done in trying to lower prescription drugs uh, for um, you know, notably and first and foremost for AIDS patients who uh, would otherwise be priced out of being able to save, save their lives. So I think that the uh, Michael Weinstein and the AIDS Health Foundation are in this for the right uh, motives. I think they, uh, all Ohioans, uh, taxpayers will benefit. Uh, 400, uh, 4 million Ohioans are affected by the legislation. Uh, which uh, currently Ohio pays about $3.3 billion a year. I think that was the price in 2016 uh, for prescription drugs. So this is about lowering uh, drug prices for the state of Ohio. Uh, estimates are that it would save Ohio taxpayers about at least $400 uh, million a year. It is modeled after the VA legislation, which Congress passed in 1992, to specifically say 
that there would be a 24 percent savings. And uh, finally, uh, State Senator Michael Skindle uh, has put forth a bill, SB uh, 215, which would enable the savings that would uh, accrue as a result of this legislation to be passed along to seniors and to veterans. Dale? Well, like the yes side, uh, the no side largely has a single funder, and that would be the pharmaceutical industry. We've made no secret about that from the very beginning. In fact, starting on May 1st, when we launched our campaign, we have it on our website under the FAQs as to who's paying for the campaign. But I want to point out that the pharmaceutical industry is one of 82 different statewide organizations who have joined the No Coalition. That includes virtually every major, major veterans group in the state, business, organized labor, and over 30,000 Ohio doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and hospitals. Um, I would also say that the entire case, or the entire rationale for passing Issue 2 has rested on two promises. Number one, everyone's drug costs are going to go down. And number two, as Dennis said, it's going to save taxpayers $400 million a year. As it turns out, neither of those claims is true, and I hope we'll have a chance to get into that as this uh, debate goes forward. But the point I want to make at the moment is that if neither of those claims is true, then the rationale for passing issue two goes up in smoke. All right. Dale, this first question is for you. No one can argue that drug prices in the U.S. are higher compared to other developed countries. The industry claims most of the money earned goes back into research and development, but it seems most of that money is made on the backs of Americans. The industry jacked the prices of older drugs, such as naloxone during an opiate epidemic, the EpiPen, and Daraprim. So we watch drug prices skyrocket, we see billions spent on advertising, and CEOs with huge bonuses. While the industry's products save lives, its tactics have damaged public trust. So for the person who has to choose between buying food and paying for medication, why should they vote no? So the first point I would make is that everyone agrees that Ohioans deserve access to affordable drugs. The problem is, is every expert who has studied this, and that includes um, three former Medicaid directors who ran the programs under both Democratic and Republican governors, a former state budget director, the current state budget director, as well as uh, all the doctors organizations. Everyone who has looked at this says it won't solve the problem and will only make things worse by actually raising drug costs for a majority of Ohioans and reducing access <clears throat> for some of our most vulnerable people. So what I would say is I get the hostility to high drug prices or the anger over that. I get the anger at drug companies. But I hope voters remember that none of those things is on the ballot this fall next week, actually, or two weeks from now in the state of Ohio. What is on the ballot is a very specific piece of legislation that every expert who has studied it says will make things worse. So don't vote your anger. Use your common sense. The other side's campaign has been largely about anger, stoking anger at the drug companies. Uh, they talk about the EpiPens, for example. But what they don't tell you is that because issue two only applies to drugs purchased by the state government, two-thirds of Ohioans are left out. Everyone who doesn't get their drugs through state programs will not see their drug costs go down by a single penny. Uh, but thanks to the cost shifting that's likely to occur, they could certainly go up. All right, 30 seconds to rebut. Everyone agrees that high prescription drug prices are a problem. But not everyone wants to do something about it. And we have to keep in mind that uh, uh, the drug companies can't name one thing they've done to try to uh, lower the cost of pharmaceuticals for the American people or the people of Ohio. Uh, in, in effect, they are uh, opposed to high drug prices, evidently, but they're also for high drug prices. Now, as far as the experts, where are all these experts? Your time's up. And, and, where, and where have the experts been as prices have gone up? Dennis, this question is for you. You claim that if issue two passes, every Ohioan will benefit with a price break from prescription drugs and the state will save $400 million. But issue two only affects those who get prescription drugs through state programs, not those with private insurance. So what specific data are you basing these claims? Well, actually, I haven't made that claim, Monica. I personally have not made that claim. If anyone has in the campaign, I would have corrected them because the truth of the matter is, 
Issue two is about the four million people who, for whom the state of Ohio purchases their prescription drugs. And if they are priced at the VA level, the state will save $400 million a year. Now, what do the rest of Ohioans have at stake here? Well, uh, to have the state purchase at the VA rate is to give the state the ability to save money for the taxpayers. So all Ohio taxpayers benefit. All Ohio taxpayers benefit. Now, what about the individuals who are purchasing, um, uh, who, who, for whom the state doesn't purchase drugs? Um, look, the price pressure that is created will have a ripple effect throughout the economy. Now, who says this? Well, there's a, a, a website called Farm Exec, and this is a quote from uh, one of their uh, writers, said VA pricing, and then is a disaster for the entire U.S. drug industry, not just for those who are doing business with the states, but a disaster for the entire U.S. drug industry. You know, this ends up being about market economics, about giving the consumers an opportunity to finally say something. Ohio can strike a blow for consumers all over America by saying we have to do something about the high cost of prescription drugs. And a good place to start is in the state of Ohio. 30 seconds. I was delighted to hear Dennis say that uh, this would not save money for the majority of Ohioans. Everyone who has private insurance, everybody who is, if you're an older Ohioan, who is on Medicare, for example, none of those people are covered. But he, but he continues to say that this is going to save taxpayers lots and lots of money. It won't, and here's why. What they want you to believe is that while the VA gets a 24% mandated discount when they buy drugs, the state of Ohio pays full price. We don't. Under federal law, Medicaid gets a 23.1% mandated discount, and Medicaid accounts for 75% of the drugs Ohio buys. Uh, that's why the state budget director in his report last week said this would not save money for the state. Speaking of... Uh, Dale, this is for you. The Ohio Office of Budget and Management released its analysis of Issue 2 on October 10th. It found there was insufficient information to estimate savings to taxpayers. The report indicated savings to Medicaid and HIV drug assistance programs were unlikely. However, it said theoretically some savings were plausible for other state agencies, such as colleges, state employee health benefits, and workers' comp, because they generally pay more because they don't qualify for federal help. So why shouldn't voters pass this? Yeah, so the first point to be made is, remember, Medicaid accounts for 75% of the drugs the state of Ohio buys, and this only applies to drugs that the state buys. So for 75% of the drugs that we buy, there will be no savings. He also concluded that for AIDS, HIV drugs, there would be no savings. He did say that with regard to some of the other pro programs, sa savings were, in his words, plausible. But then he went on to say, but whatever savings there might be would be eaten up by the increased administrative costs would come into play because you'd have to hire additional auditors, accountants, and so forth to comply with Issue 2's rules, cost shifting that's likely to occur, and the cost to the state of the lawsuits that are that would likely be filed. So the truth of the matter is there, is there is going to be very, very little savings. And, you know, the Medicaid directors who actually ran the programs and bought the drugs under the last four Ohio governors say the problem is, is that in addition to those ma mandated discounts that we talked about a moment ago, the 23.1 percent, Ohio also negotiates additional discounts and rebates. And the Medicaid director's concern is that if this gets put into law, the drug companies will no longer negotiate those additional rebates and dis discounts, the voluntary ones. And if those go away, that could actually raise what the state pays for drugs by tens of millions of dollars a year. So that's why I say this whole idea that there are going to be savings is a chimera. It is simply not there. 30 seconds. This would be the first time in the history of, uh, of America that drug companies were opposed to having higher prices. Uh, I, I want to say that with respect to the OBM report, that uh, the, the OBM said they couldn't determine the VA pricing. Well, I'm going to help you, speaking to them directly, go to the VA.org website, because there you'll find 17,500 drug prices uh, in the Office of, of Acquisitions and Logistics. Uh, they have pharmaceutical price. They just updated it a couple days ago, so please. Uh, you're going to be uh, Office of Budget and Management. 
you can't budget and you can't manage. Dennis, you got to do better. I did go. I did look at it. The, the problem, though, is that there is um, some of those prices are confidential. Some of the prices on some of the drugs are not listed. So uh, can I respond? Sure. OK, the prices may, are confidential. May I also respond? Shouldn't we find out? I mean, look. As a member of Congress, I regularly use Freedom of Information Act. Every journalist here knows about the Freedom of Information Act. Go and FOIA it. What is this, the ostrich defense? We can't know. We just can't know. There are some things that are unknowable in life. <laughs> it, like prescription drug prices. No, that has to stop. P vote yes, and that starts to turn it around. Well, this once again demonstrates how little uh, the yes side knows about the way the law actually works. What Monica is referring to is this. The VA, the mandatory drug discounts, everybody knows, because that's a law. That's 24%. But these voluntary discounts that are reached, those are regarded as private contracts. And by federal law, they are not disclosed. You cannot FOIA them, Dennis. You, when you go on the website, as you just told every, everyone to do, the only thing that shows up there is the mandated discount, not the voluntary prices. Though, now, you're welcome to try to change, you and issue uh, two, yes side, you're welcome to try to change the law, but the law, and specifically Title 38 of the U.S. Code, and I can give you the rest of the citation if you like, says that those prices cannot be disclosed. And that's why the budget director, who does know what he's talking about, says that we can't know what the lowest price paid by the VA is. And, and the, the truth of the matter is that the Ohio legislature, in the implementation of this law, has every right to go in and get the prices. We're gonna get, I mean, this black box uh, we're gonna, uh, Dennis, we're approach gonna get, is wrong. We're going to get to that point. But first of all, there is nothing in the law to explain how this would be implemented or enforced if passed. So how will that happen? How soon? And how, how can voters be guaranteed those tax savings? Well, uh, first of all, the savings are not imaginary. There's uh, two studies that have been done, and I have uh, copies of them. One is the Melman Report that talks about uh, making Ohio uh, prescriptions more affordable. And the other one is the Murray Report that went uh, right here that went deeply into quantifying the uh, amount that would be saved. And he came up with a range that went as high as over $500 million. We used the 400 million figure as a, uh, uh, as a conservative estimate. So that's number one. Number two, the Ohio legislature would have the responsibility of implementing this together with rulemaking, uh, you know, with the, those who handle Medicaid in the state of Ohio. I mean, if we're operating in the public interest, and that's really the measure here, are we using the public interest as the, as the bottom line? If we're using the public interest as the bottom line, then we push for full disclosure, then we I mean, th this, this very idea that we can't know does violence to cognition. So, I mean, if you follow that along, the idea of a proprietary formulary or price list puts every consumer, uh, puts a blindfold on every consumer and on state officials. The implementation of this law would necessarily require the state to start getting answers about how these things are priced. I mean, there's a reason why drug prices or uh, profits are going through the roof. We go state to state and you say, well, you just can't really know about this. That's ridiculous. And we, we have to, Time. Uh, and that's why people ought to vote yes. Well, as I say, Dennis, you're free to try to change federal law, but that's what you have to do. And issue two would not change that law. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that the studies that you mentioned, Melman and Murray, are actually one study. Melman referred to Murray in his study. And I know Max Mellon. He's a lovely man. But he's a law professor at Case. He has no background in state procurement, no background in state budgeting. But the current state budget director and others have all concluded that this would not save money. I'd also like to make one more point, Monica, but I think I'm going to be out of time. But I want to talk, uh, maybe we'll get a chance. I'd like to talk about why issue two only limits, can only limit, any ballot initiative can only limit what the state pays for a product. You can't require the manufacturer to sell the product at that price. We'll get, yeah. we'll get to that. Um, while I have you, though, a number of states are considering or have already implemented price gouging and transparency laws. Maryland was first. 
Already a trade group of drug manufacturers has sued in federal court. New York, uh, California's governor just signed a law two weeks ago. So if there's already a trend of holding pharmaceutical companies accountable for exorbitant pricing, why shouldn't Ohioans get on board and pass this? <clears throat> because this is not those other laws. This, issue two, you, you've got to remember, the only other place this was on the ballot was last year in the state of California when the same fellow who's behind it here, Mr. Weinstein, put this on the ballot in the state of California, arguably the most progressive uh, state in the union. It went down in the state of California and every single major newspaper in the state, even liberal papers like the LA Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, all editorialized against it. In that sense, it mirrors what's happening here in Ohio. Every single newspaper in the state that has made an endorsement has urged a no vote. That includes the Plain Dealer, the Beacon Journal, uh, the uh, Warren uh, paper, the uh, Lorraine Morning Journal, and a bunch of papers in between. This issue too, they also tried to get this through the legislature in the state of Vermont earlier this year, Bernie Sanders' home you know, state. But the legislature in Vermont would not pass it either. Issue two is bad public policy that won't work and will only make things worse. This other legislation that you were talking about, that may or may not be a good idea. I don't know. I'd have to look at them. But what I do know for sure, and the only reason I'm on this side, I've been involved in the fight for affordable drugs for most of my adult life. And I'm telling you, the only reason I'm on the other side this time is because I refuse to support bad public policy that's going to make things worse and make it harder for people who need affordable drugs to get them. 30 seconds. Uh, I'd like to take issue with something that was said here describing California as the most progressive state in the union. I think that uh, on election day, Ohio will be able to claim that when it votes yes. Uh, I, I want to say that my experience and my involvement in this issue isn't just for this campaign. In Congress, uh, I introduced legislation with John Conyers to create HR 676, universal single-payer health care, which had a prescription drug benefit, and also uh, HR 6800, which would have required Medicare to negotiate directly with the drug companies. It's not a new idea. Dennis, you brought up California. So this measure was uh, it did fail in California last year. And California does have a history of being quite progressive in adopting cutting edge health care policy. Why did they come to Ohio though? Why didn't they try another progressive state like Oregon or Washington? Why Ohio? Well, let's face it, the pharmaceutical industry has a lot of influence in Ohio, no question about it. But Ohio with its uh, large population and with four million people who are currently affected by the state programs uh, represented, I believe, an, an excellent place to raise the issues about the high cost of health care uh, and to be able to bring the facts out about what, uh, what Americans are facing here. Uh, you know, Americans are paying more than any other country in the world for prescription drugs. The drug company's CEO, their, their level of compensation annually, I'll just read you some numbers here. 28.3 million, 21.2 million, 17.7 million, 17.5 million, 17 million, 16.9 million. This is, this is what these people make annually because their profits are so high. Ohio's a great place to, to raise this argument because Ohio's middle America. Ohio is the place where you have a breakthrough, it affects the whole country. Uh, the, the profit margins of these drug companies, and this is an issue here, uh, are 25 percent to 62.7 percent, uh, and the per capita spending in, in, in other countries versus the United States. People in the U.S. are paying two times what people in Canada, France, Australia, Spain, and, and South Korea pay, three times what people in Poland pay, five times what people in Denmark pay for prescription drugs. Ohio is the place to have this debate. Ohio is the place for a breakthrough. Ohio is the place for a yes vote to change the game nationally. Keep in mind that nothing in issue two <clears throat> would change the way drug companies compensate their executives. Has, has nothing to do with what we pay versus what they pay in Sweden or Denmark or any other country in this world. So these are, these are all red herrings. The, the, these are things that have nothing to do with issue two, all right? As to, why, as, as, to, as to why Mr. Weinstein, I didn't interrupt you, Dennis. How about not interrupting me? Ms. 
Mr. Weinstein, as to why he brought it here, I'm going to guess it's because it's relatively easy to get something on the ballot here in the state of Ohio. You pay a million bucks or a little more, which he did, and you can get things on the ballot. Next question. <clears throat> Part of the law indicates that taxpayers have to pay the legal fees for the proponents if the law is challenged, but there's no limit on those legal fees. But if the case loses, they're only required to pay back 10000 So why should voters pay those legal fees when we have an attorney general who would take the case anyway? Dennis, I'll start with you. Well, the issue two petitioners have already said they wouldn't seek legal fees as long as the attorney general stands by uh, his word. And, uh, and I, you know, this at this point is a moot issue because the AG has already said he would defend it. And that the, uh, the, the reason why that was put in the legislation to begin with, I mean, this is like a reality testing moment. When the people of Ohio pass this, the drug companies will do everything to try to win in court what they couldn't win on the ballot. So this protects the people of, o of Ohio's basic interest. Yet the attorney general said he's going to defend it. It's a moot issue. And it's a moot issue because the petitioners have said, look, we are, uh, we are not going to uh, seek to take uh, any legal fees as long as the AG office stands by it. So look, uh, you don't want to pass something like this and be defenseless, be unable to defend the public interest when the drug companies want to come out and they want to beat you in court. So this made sense, but I'm glad that it's worked out to where it's a moot issue. Well, it's not a moot issue, not by a long shot. Read the ballot language for yourself. It's only two paragraphs long, about 100 words. The whole second paragraph deals with, with this legal, legal issue. What does it do? It gives the four named sponsors of the ballot initiative, three of whom work for Mr. Weinstein, an unprecedented right to intervene in any legal challenge that may be filed against the law if it's, if it's passed, and requires the taxpayers of this state to pay their attorney fees without a limit or cap of any kind in whether they win or lose. Now, Dennis says, oh, don't worry, it's all moot now because the Attorney General is going to defend it. That isn't what it says. The ballot initiative says the Attorney General shall defend the law and it gives these folks the right to hire their own lawyers. The reason that's important, Mr. Weinstein is a legal bounty hunter. This is a guy who's filed 52 lawsuits oh. against government oh. agencies in seven different states, including three in Ohio. Hold Giving him down. this kind of blank check can get very expensive for but taxpayers. But why shouldn't the people who have a vested interest in this issue be able to sue to protect it, especially when we're up against pharma? You know, the state would be up against pharma, who we know has deep pockets, and they have the ability to drag cases through the courts for years. This has never been in Ohio law in our history. No law has ever had this provision in it, in it neither has any ballot initiative. The Attorney General, that's the way the system works. When a law is challenged in Ohio, the Attorney General defends the law. And he would in this case, too. But for some reason, Mr. Weinstein and his friends wrote into this law the provision giving them the right to hire their own attorneys along with that. How it would work operationally, I'm not sure. Would they sit side by side with the Attorney General while he's doing his work? We, we don't know. But what, I'll, what I will uh, also say is that <clears throat> Um, I completely lost my train of thought there, uh, but uh, um, the... Uh, Lawyers suing. Oh, yeah. So what the other side wants you to believe is, oh, maybe, maybe the pharmaceutical companies are going to file suit. Well, Dennis, how about this? What if the petitioners, what if they don't like the way Ohio is implementing the law? They don't think we're, that we're doing it quickly enough for them. Might they sue the state? And then the taxpayers of our state would be in the ridiculous position of paying lawyers' fees for the privilege of being sued ourselves. Now, how about the time here? Because you're, you know, there's some variations in time. You want to start that? Yeah. Daniel, you, you know. Yeah. Can, you start it, can you start it again go back at 30, to 30. please? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Dennis. Bottom line, the people of Ohio have a right to defend their will in court, and the petitioners on this have already said that as long as the AG is going to defend it, that's fine. Now, I, I want to take exception to the really vicious aspect of this campaign, the personal attacks on Mr. Weinstein, who is, who is someone who's a humanitarian, who is trying to uh, lower drug price in Ohio, and what's happening is this, this industry has targeted him. Look, I could spend time here and tear up these, uh, the, the heads of these drug companies for price fixing and all kinds of things, and name them. But I'm not going to do that. This is about 
lower drug prices in, o in Ohio, and that's where we ought to stay focused on, and not smearing people because their involvement in it. I mean, really, that's, it's disgusting. That's politics lately. Oh, excuse though. me. It's no, not it's not, Monica. I'm sorry. That is not politics. This is somebody who is, is basically a humanitarian, who's worked on AIDS, uh, uh, furthering research, and he's being vilified here uh, over and over. So the election's about Michael Weinstein? Think about that. May why why are the drug well, companies doing that? Go ahead. Nobody is saying, Dennis, that Mr. Weinstein and his organization haven't done some good things. They have. But there's a dark, darker side to Mr. Weinstein, too, that I think voters in this state ought to know about. Mis Mr. Weinstein has takes tens of millions of dollars out of his nonprofit foundation to run political campaigns all, all over the country, about $50 million worth over the last year. Uh, Oftentimes, those campaigns have nothing to do with the anti-HIV AIDS mission of his I'm gonna, foundation. I'm going to stop you there. This, this issue is not about Mr. Weinstein. This issue is I about agree. lower drug prices. I agree. Um, can I have one more question? Sure. Okay. And this was... <laughs> um, Dennis, this is to you. The federal government does not have the ability to negotiate lower prices for the 40-plus million Americans who are seniors who are on Medicare Part D. So what makes you think the state of Ohio could do so for state residents when the law only applies to state purchasers, not manufacturers? Well, this is why I fought Medicare Part D. I was in Congress, I was involved in the debate because they basically enabled the drug, price, the drug companies to name their price and get it, notwithstanding whatever uh, f phony uh, uh, reductions come about. Uh, we need to negotiate. That's the bottom line. We shouldn't be afraid to negotiate. We should be insisting that the state negotiate on behalf of the people of Ohio. And there is no reason why the implementation of Issue 2 could not result in, in, in savings of at least $400 million a year for the Ohio taxpayers and start the movement that, uh, that focuses on setting VA pricing as the standard, which uh, would cause the entire drug industry to be affected, uh, and I think this is, you know, this is something that uh, that is behind the effort to try to lower the cost of pharmaceuticals in the state. And seniors, uh, you're right about this, Monica. Seniors are are the hardest hit. Uh, they're having difficulty paying for their drugs. Uh, if you look at inflation, uh, last year uh, inflation was about 0.1 uh, percent, but the cost of uh, uh, the retail prices of 268 brand name drugs went up 15.1% uh, in 2006 to 2009. 113 drug prices, uh, uh, a, a, a selection of those went up 188.7%. And the average cost from one bra brand name uh, prescription drug on, used on a chronic basis uh, was 5,800 a year. This is a life and death matter for a lot of seniors. Dennis says the only thing issue two would do would require the state to negotiate for lower drug prices. In fact, he's got an air right now, I, I add on the air right now, I believe, in uh, Cleveland here saying that. The state already does negotiate. The state doesn't need the authority. We negotiate so well that the current state budget direct director, who has no dog in this hunt, says that Ohio is already paying as good as or better than the VA for most most of the drugs we buy. But I also want to get to this thing. Issue two can only limit what the state pays for a drug. It cannot require a manufacturer to sell the drug at that price. So what happens if a manufacturer simply says, no, I will not sell you this, I'm gonna answer. this or that drug. Well, let me just finish the point then if he's going to answer it. What if they say, I'm not going to sell this drug at this or that price? Issue two doesn't say you have to negotiate. Issue two prohibits the state from buying the drug if they can't get that VA price, prohibits it, unless the state can figure out a way to lower its own costs so that we would meet the target price. Well, how could they do that? One way they could do it is okay, by okay. increasing copays. I'm going to stop you there. Dennis, 30 seconds. Any prohibitions can be dealt with in implementation, number one. Number two, if the drug companies say they won't sell, uh, that's a direct trip to federal court on an antitrust issue. There are underlying antitrust issues here related to the way the market is organized with respect and, and dominated by certain drug companies. And so, you know, failure to deal is a, is a significant issue here. And I think that it, uh, it would be raised uh, very quickly in federal court. Dan? Today we are enjoying a debate.
debate on issue two, featuring Dennis Kucinich, who you just heard from, a spokesman for the issue two campaign, and Dale Butland, spokesman for the campaign against issue two. Our moderator is Monica have? Robbins of WKYC. We're about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our webcast. If you'd like to tweet a question, you can tweet it at the City Club, and our team will work it into the program. Holding our microphones today are our Membership and Customer Experience Manager, Corey Isler, and our Youth Forum Council Chair, Tiolu Orsanya. May we have our first question, please? Yes, I have a question as a non-attorney spokesman. Please explain to me in language an engineer would understand why the people pushing this issue reserve the right for themselves to intervene, in, as in Section G, and how can they force the state legislature and governor to act as described in Section D5? Thank you. That's for you. Okay. I said it earlier, I'll say it again. The Attorney General has pledged to defend the interests of the people of the state. That was put in the language. It had to go, first of all, I'll take this in sequence, that it was put in the language of the law to make sure that the people of Ohio would not be defeated in court by the drug companies. The AG is going to defend it, that's fine. The people who are connected with issue two, the petitioners, say they're not going to, uh, as long as the AG keeps his word, uh, they're, not, they're not going to go into court. So that's it. I mean, there's a deal on that, and it's a moot issue. It is. It, there is, Dennis, there is no deal on this, and there's no sequencing. This ballot language from the very beginning, issue two, has always said that the attorney general shall defend the law. And it gives Mr. Weinstein and his friends the right to hire their own lawyers besides. Now, recently, they've held a press conference. and said, oh, well, if the attorney general defends, then, we, then we're not going to. But that won't be in the law if this passes. Remember, in the law, they will have the right to hire their own attorneys, and the taxpayers have to pay their attorney fees without cap or limit of any kind. Time. Next question. So the VA uh, serves a certain population, and I imagine that their drug formulary is based on the population that they serve. At the same time, the state serves a number of uh, people in, in the Medicaid program, which you said would um, represent 75% of the um, drug purchases for the state, um, covers a lot of children and women, and I imagine that the formularies aren't the same. So my question is, what happens to the drugs that are not on the VA formulary that the uh, people from the Medicaid program and other state people would need? <clears throat> that is a really excellent question. So the first thing you need to understand is that the VA formulary is relatively narrow because it's designed for military veterans who tend to be older and male. Okay? The state of Ohio buys drugs for a much, much wider group of people. In fact, most of the people on Medicaid are women, children, infants. The VA only has 17,000 drugs on its formulary. Ohio Medicaid buys 44,000 drugs. So for one program in the state, Medicaid, less than half the drugs we buy are on the VA formulary. So what happens when we have to buy drugs that are not on the VA formulary? Obviously, there's no VA price now. Can the state continue to buy those drugs? If, if so, at what price? We don't know because, because issue two doesn't say. But what you'll oftentimes hear the other side say is, oh, don't worry, if we have to buy drugs that aren't in the VA formula, we'll just keep buying them at whatever price we're currently paying. Well, Dennis, if you're doing that, there's no discount. There's no VA discount. There's no savings. So what happens to this $400 million that you claim the taxpayers are going to save? It's gone. 30 seconds, Dennis. The, um, the restrictive formulary, let's first of all go to the population we're talking about in Ohio. Four million people. Uh, would be covered uh, by this 164,000 of which are children. So it's not that children are being left out. And as far as being able to harmonize the differences in formulary, that's what happens after this is passed. You can't do it before it's passed because there's no forward motion on the issue. So you work at, you know, of course we're concerned uh, to make sure that those who are covered by the state are going to receive uh, 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 appropriate uh, benefits 
for the specific drugs that they take. Uh, but the formularies are not, uh, the, the state formulary isn't locked in stone. It's constantly changing, and we need to be able to adjust to that. Next question. Hi, I'm a uh, retired family physician, and I'm proud to be a member of the Ohio Academy of Family Practice, which is the one and only major medical, in major medical group in this state, which is for issue two. I happen to know that none of the other groups actually listened to both sides. They only heard the no side. And when I talked about this with Dr. Robert Ruff, the former head of neurology, uh, I'll skip that and go to my question. Uh, the question that I have is it seems to me that the opposition to issue two is an opposition to fair prices. It wants so-called market prices. It seems to me that a fair price is an effectively negotiated price, which is what happens in all the other nations. So my question is, how do we get to effectively negotiated prices if governments can't negotiate strongly? Is that to me? The answer is, Ohio is already negotiating. When Dennis was in Congress, he tried to pass legislation to allow Medicare to negotiate. Right? And it's true, Me Medicare can't negotiate prices, but that's a federal law. In Ohio, we can, we can and do negotiate prices. With regard, doctor, to your organization, it is true that you are the one major medical organization in the state that has endorsed it. I don't know if you read the letter that, that uh, came with that endorsement. It said that, well, issue two is very simplistic. It is deeply flawed. Probably not the best way of doing this, but it's the best thing we have, so that's what we're going to do. Meanwhile, we have 38 medical organizations, including Children's Hospital right here in Cleveland, uh, the Academy of Medicine right here in Cleveland, 38 different medical organizations. If hospitals, if hospitals thought that issue two would lower their drug costs, don't you think they'd be for it? No? no. <laughs> well, that's unusual. <laughs> but I will tell you that doctors and nurses who care about their patients, who see them every day struggle with trying to afford their care as well as their prescriptions, what doctors and nurses are opposed to this, the Ohio Nurses Association, the Medical Association, because they see a double whammy coming from this. Higher drug costs for most people and reduced access for some of our most vulnerable. That's why these people are against it, not because they're in the pocket of the drug companies. Dennis? This, is, this issue, too, is about pegging a negotiating price to the VA price. 24% reduction. Now, to answer the gentleman's question, 24% of what? In Ohio, drug prices have been kept artificially high. And there's been, you know, drug companies are notorious for overbilling Medicare and Medicaid, for, uh, for their monopoly practices, for kickbacks, for false statements on, uh, on, on, on reports. Uh, and, and I want someone to tell me when, when the drug companies have ever voluntarily agreed to lower the, uh, uh, the cost of prescription drugs for a large group of people. This is why it was necessary to pass the, uh, uh, the VA uh, health benefit bill to begin with. Right, time. Next question. <clears throat> yes, this is for the proponents, for Dennis. Your most recent statement makes it very obvious to me, a pharmacist of 46, 47 years, a former vendor selection committee member for University Hospital Consortium, that you do not understand pricing for group purchasing organizations. The, the, very simply, the Section 194.01.D.1 states that the net price, net price, and members of GCHA can now back me up on this, is all volume discounts, fill rates, and that type of thing. You make a statement that this is, an un, you know, this is a price that can be known. This cannot be known. How do you think you're going to get Cleveland Clinic, University Hospital, that type of thing, Metro, to reveal a secret negotiation? Uh, because the market is changing dramatically right now. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you uh, where my source is for that. The, uh, this is a report that came out just uh, last month from uh, Investors Business Weekly. They're talking about how generic prices are falling. And what does this article say? 
It says that wholesalers are forcing price cuts, that they're, they're using their buying power, they're using their negotiating power, which is what the state is going to be. This article, quote, uh, says that it means lower drug prices for patients. And they talk about how there's dropping uh, profits for generics. They're dropping at, at a rate of 6.2% a year. And that stocks are trading sideways. There's changes in the marketplace. That's what's driving this right now. And those changes in the marketplace are affecting the drug companies directly. The whole world is moving in a direction of lower prices. Why should the people of Ohio end up getting stuck with higher prices and not negotiating further discounts when all other wholesale private markets, are, are the prices are going down? This is really about whether we as taxpayers will stand up for the people of Ohio and say that they ought to pay less, not more, period. <clears throat> So I'm not quite sure what this article has to do with issue two, particularly since 80% of the drugs bought by the VA, as well as 80% of the drugs bought by Ohio, are generics. They're not, brand, they're not brand name drugs. But in any event, Dennis continues to come back to say, well, all this is about is giving, this, uh, giving Ohio a 24% discount, just like the VA. But remember, under federal law, Medicaid drugs, which account for 75% of the drugs we buy, get a 23.1% mandated discount. That's less than 1% difference from the VA, and then we negotiate additional ones. The state budget director says we're already getting as good or better prices than the VA for the vast majority of drugs we buy. Next question. Welcome, welcome back, Congressman. Good to see you haven't lost your old fight. <laughs> I preface my remarks by saying that I've taken pride uh, in my 84 years before I went to any, in, in vote any issue, I, vote, I did my homework to see why I'm for or against it. This one I have found so confusing. I have read, and there's been plenty of literature on both sides, and plenty of television ads, and I've watched them carefully. I'm still confused. But the thing that, that I have to raise to you, Congressman, is that the um, pro side put out a flyer, a postcard thing, with a picture of Dr. Col Col Cosgrove of the Cleveland Clinic. I must admit, I didn't read every detail very carefully, but it clearly, because it's for the, from, from the pro, pro side, I took it to mean that Cogs Grove was supporting issue two. I subsequently talked to a doctor friend of mine in the clinic and said, well, I was surprised your, your doctor is supporting this. And he set me straight very fast. And I, I suddenly learned that the clinic denied this, in fact, objected to issue two people using it. So my question to you is, why did you do that? Secondly, how come has, has issue to uh, uh, clarify or issue any apology or clarification in support of Dr. Cosgrove in the clinic? Here you're taking a well-known, world-renowned doctor and a world-renowned institution with their reputation and make it sound like they are for your side. Uh, it leads me to wonder also, with all the other literature put out, if that one is wrong, how much of the other literature can I believe? How much of the other is accurate or tainted? Uh, Bruce, good to see you again. Uh, always a pleasure. Um, look, I came into this campaign a few weeks ago, and I can't tell you that I know what the campaign did on that, uh, and I'm not in the habit of defending positions that I don't know anything about. But what I am in the ha habit of doing, and what I have led the effort in, is trying to look at the larger issue of health care costs. Uh, right now, Americans spend about $3.4 trillion a year on health care, that's all spending. One out of every three of those dollars goes for corporate profits, stock options, executive salaries, advertising, marketing, the cost of paperwork. This is why I introduced a single payer bill 10 or more years ago into Congress so that people would be able to survive and thrive and it would help this country move forward economically. Now 10% of the, approximately 10% of, of the amount that goes for health care spending goes for pharmaceuticals. And when you look at the profit margins that are involved in there, if we cut out that profit incentive, we would have enough money to not just give everyone a prescription drug benefit in America, but also have vision care, dental health care, mental health care, long-term care, along with prescription drugs. That's the kind of money that's in this system right now. And that's the kind of money that's being, uh, that's being redirected to the private sector for profits to the disadvantage of the people of the United States and, in this case, the people of Ohio, 
That's why issue two is important to, uh, to pass and to vote yes as the first chance that people have anywhere to say something against this, this rotten system. And yes, it is about the system. It's not just about All a right. narrow piece of legislation. Dennis Tan. I think the gentleman's question deserves at least one answer. The answer is no, they have not apologized. The Cleveland Clinic a, sent a cease and desist uh, letter for misrepresenting their position. But this is what Mr. Weinstein does. Now, I know Monica says, I don't want to talk about Weinstein. But as you're trying to decide who's telling the truth and who isn't, you should also know that earlier this year in California, Mr. Weinstein did the same thing in a ballot campaign out there. The mayor of Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Times newspaper, and the LA County Sheriff's Office all sent cease and desist letters for, for misrepresenting their positions on a different ballot issue that uh, he was involved in out there. Next question. Uh, hello, my name is Tracy Jones, and I am actually one of Mr. Weinstein's friends. I am actually a signer on the initiative, and I also sent a cease and desist order because you all called me a gang member, you and your colleagues. Um, so I would like to say today that it's really important that you understand I don't plan to sue anyone, and neither do my colleagues, as long as the will of the people is done. I need for that to be out there. And I just want to say and ask the question to Mr. Kucinich, why is it that they're spending $3.1 million a week if, in fact, this initiative wouldn't be of substance and wouldn't be helpful to the citizens of Ohio? Why is so much money being spent to confuse people? Thank you for testifying to what I had said repeatedly here, which is you're not going to go forward with any legal action as long as the state does what it says it's going, it's going to do, and the AG keeps his word. So number one, thank you. Um, in California, the drug company spent $126 million to block a similar initiative to lower drug prices. Why? It goes back to what I've been saying all along. The farm exec article that talked about VA pricing would be a disaster for the entire drug industry. And just so, just so you know that that's uh, uh, not being taken out of context, I'm going to read to you a qualifying paragraph from this farm exec report. It says, and this is about the ca a similar initiative in California. Regardless, here's the point. If the voters of California approve this proposition, it would establish an incredibly deep mandatory discount. In essence, a price control. This is the industry talking for the public purchase of prescription drugs in America's largest state. Such an action would no doubt cause an immediate demand for the same VA discount rate to be made available to other states, the federal government, and likely private entities as well. In short, adoption of VA pricing by the state of California would be a pricing disaster for the entire U.S. drug industry. They have hundreds of billions of dollars at stake. Why wouldn't they invest millions in trying to get the people of Ohio to vote against their own interests? 30 seconds. Yeah, so <clears throat> what Dennis forgot to tell you is that he wants you to believe that this went down in California because the drug company spent all this money. But does that explain why every major newspaper in the state editorialized against it? Were they all in the pocket of Big Pharma too? <laughs> so all so all the newspaper all the newspapers were bought too. So I think we're in kind of conspiracy land here, aren't we? Um, as for why the drug companies would spend the kind of money that they're spending, I don't speak for the drug companies. I speak for the campaign, of which the drug companies are a member. But we, as I say, we have 82 coalition members. But I would guess that, number one, the VA discount, when it was passed by Congress, was only supposed to be for veterans. It was never intended to apply to everybody. It was in honor of their service and sacrifice. I'm going to guess the drug companies may not want to see that precedent. And second, like every indus other industry in America and maybe the world, I suspect the drug industry does not like artificial price controls. Next question. Uh, my name is Bill Keller. I'm a veteran. Okay. Dennis, you keep saying uh, what's best for the, the, the um, residents of the state of Ohio. Uh, I'm one of the 8,000 thankfully, who does not get their pharmaceuticals through a state program, okay? So my question to you is this. You're asserting, uh, the, the proponents of the issue are asserting that my drug costs can go down, or probably will, or may. Uh, I don't believe that. My pharmaceutical, uh, the way we get our pharmaceuticals has nothing to do with the state of, the, of Ohio. So 
for the other eight million people, you know, why are their costs that, that this uh, proposition asserts, why are their costs going to go down and, in fact, not up? Um, earlier in the presentation, I made clear who benefits directly. And if anyone didn't hear that, I'll repeat it again. Four million Ohioans who are, who, for whom the state negotiates. The state currently spends about $3.3 billion a year. They will benefit because the, uh, the state will have to peg its negotiating position to the VA 24% discount. Now, I have never said that all Ohioans will see their prescriptions reduced directly. Ohio taxpayers will benefit directly. Four million Ohioans will benefit directly. But how will others benefit? That's a, that's a legitimate question. And here's how others will benefit. I'm going to read from a farmexec.com. This is the industry speaking here. Regardless, here's the point. If the voters, and I'll substitute California for Ohio, if the voters of Ohio approve this proposition, it would establish an incredibly deep mandatory discount, in essence a price control, for the public purchase of prescription drugs in one of America's largest states. Such an action would no doubt, and here's where you would benefit, cause an immediate demand for the same VA discount rate to be made available in other states, the federal government, and likely private entities as well. In short, adoption of VA pricing, in this case by the state of Ohio, would be a pricing disaster for the whole US drug industry. This is why the drug companies are trying to beat this, because it's going to benefit everyone in, in, in time, but immediately 4 million Ohioans. The problem is that's not what the VA itself says. And the reason that every major veterans organization in this state has joined the No Coalition is because when this was on the ballot last year in California, the VA was asked to do an issue brief about what the impact on the VA would be if something like this were to pass in California or the state of Ohio. What they found is that the VA's drug costs would likely go up by $4 billion a year because those voluntary discounts and rebates we talked about would go away. A recent Secretary of Veterans Affairs uh, under President George W. Bush has written a letter to veterans here saying that this is a dagger pointed at the heart of Ohio's 800,000 veterans. And I will tell you, since they just had an increase in their co-pays this year, raising what, they pri raising what they pay for prescription drugs is no way to thank a veteran for their service. We are out of time, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> For those of you interested in more analysis of the issue, I would direct you to yesterday's Sound of Ideas on WCPN that had a robust conversation uh, by, uh, by the campaigns, followed by an even more robust conversation by some journalists, at least one of whom is present here today. So thank you all so much for being here today at the City Club. We've been enjoying a debate on Issue 2 featuring Dale Butlin, spokesman for the Vote No on Issue 2 campaign, and Dennis Kucinich, spokesman for the Vote Yes on Issue 2 campaign. Our moderator was Monica Robbins, senior health reporter for WKYC. Our community partner today is the Center for Health, health Affairs. We appreciate your partnership. Additionally, we welcome guests at tables hosted by the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, No on Issue 2, and Porter Wright. We thank all of you for being here today. That brings us to the end of our debate. Thank you, Mr. Butland and Congressman Kucinich. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Payne Fund, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.